uh, I will introduce the next speaker. Our next speaker is Cesar Vargas. He's a PhD student at Rockefeller University. He's very passionate about understanding how animals behave. He uses the lens of neuroethology to think about the evolution of brains and behavior across different species. Um, so Cesar, take it away. Great. Um, is my screen shared? Great. All right, so thanks for the introduction. So I'm gonna talk to you about how these vocal systems and vocal muscles that Arco started to introduce can uh, like in a very fine and sort of temporal manner be described functionally in the motor cortex of um, mice. So movement coordination is a super intricate um, behavior. And here's an example of speech which requires coordination across multiple muscles and multiple systems and is very complicated. So for a long time, people have wondered how does the brain actually control our movements? And this goes back to the 1870s with Fritz and Hirschzig, and then famously with uh, Penfield and sort of the idea of the homunculus where you can stimulate parts of the motor cortex that will represent specific parts of the body. This has been extended to many different species. Here I have an example from mouse, excuse the sirens outdoors, sorry. And uh, more contemporaneously, there's been a lot of work on what um, Graziano and others have described as the action maps of the brain rather than uh, part of the motor cortex specifically just uh, representing a muscle or a feature. It is sort of the gross be motor behavior and sort of its full execution. So what does this look like for vocalizations? As I said, people have done these sort of motor cortical stimulations for a while. And here I have an example from um, macaque brain in the premotor cortex. The black sites are places that were stimulated that led to uh, vocal adduction, vocal muscle adduction. Uh, I'm not gonna say full production. I don't think they did stimulations long enough to do that. But in any case, stimulating in these areas led to vocal fold um, modulation. We can use these studies to kind of estimate more or less the circuitry that underlies the vocal functions. So for example, in humans, we have two uh, pathways for our, uh, vocal muscles in the larynx. One is indirect. So it goes from the motor cortex to this um, green area called the reticular formation, then to the nucleus ambiguous motor neurons, then to the larynx. We also have a direct projection, which goes directly from the motor cortex to this orange nucleus ambiguous, and then to the larynx. Macaques, on the other hand, don't have this direct projection, is indirect, so it, it is exclusively from motor cortex or premotor cortex to particular formation, nucleus ambiguous uh, larynx. And these have sort of been estimated with uh, temporal latencies from stimulation in the direct projection setting from seven to 20 milliseconds, and in the indirect setting where you have more neurons in between, 20 to 40 milliseconds, or generally just short and long latencies. There's been a lot of work in humans trying to describe this latency, trying to understand how we have such fine control of speech. Uh, that study I just showed from macaques had a longer latency, so it makes sense, right? They, have an in, they only have an indirect pathway. And as Arco just showed in an orofacial muscle used in vocalization, there are also short latencies in mice. So here's just an example from a recent paper from uh, Eddie Chang's lab where they stimulated human motor cortex. And e despite the differences in voltage or even uh, amperage in other studies, the temporal latency doesn't change, only the magnitude of the effect. So in humans, we can pretty much estimate about 10 milliseconds or less. In other muscle systems, so for example, the, ma the macaque, which has direct um, motor neuron projections for muscles like the bicep and the fingers, you do also see these shortened latencies. The mouse whisker pad seems to have interesting situations where you have two different types of latencies, a short and a long, which is very curious. So why must musculus? Why am I not doing this in other animals? Well, as Arco very nicely introduced, mice have very uh, cool and intricate vocal behaviors. Here you see a bunch of different syllables. You can see they have a lot of variety and modulation. Um, we consider them to have some sort of sequencing and there's analogous um, sort of construction, um, not an analogous, sorry, but across different contexts, these sequences can change. And I think Catherine will talk a little bit sort of that temporal regularity that's important. But to my talk and my study, there's this really interesting thing that 
we our lab discovered is that when you use a retrograde transsynaptic virus in the laryngeal musculature of the mouse, you actually find a pool of motor neurons in the primary motor cortex. And using anterograde and retrograde tracing from M1 and the larynx again, you see that these um, there are there's sort of a convergence of the fibers at the um, ambiguous motor neurons that project to the larynx. So this was a pretty cool idea that maybe there is something going on. Mice have actually pretty fine control of their vocalizations. So to sort of start to functionally test this, I'm using uh, intercortical microstimulation with paired EMG. So here's a quick sort of cartoon of the potential vocal motor system that I've just described. And I use um, stimulation of the cortex with EMGs in the laryngeal musculature. And inspired by ARCO study and another recent one, uh, from the Kleinfeld lab, uh, I think it was last year, describing the orofacial motor cortex, there's pretty good reason to, for us to look here as well to see if maybe the larynx was also represented elsewhere. And quickly, so I'll have this stimulation pattern and then there's gonna be a muscular response and the time between those two is what I'm considering the latency. So just to give you a quick sense of an orientation of where I stimulated, it's this orofacial motor cortex, which I'm at, uh, abbreviating as OFC rather than OMC, sorry, Arco and LMC uh, in green, which is where we located our laryngeal muscles. And again, you know, four pulse stimulation that lasts eight and a half milliseconds. Those other studies, which I showed you from humans in particular, use different stimulation parameters, which is probably what leads to some of that variation that we see in the latencies described. So let's get into it. So if we look at the cricothyroid muscle first, you see that if you stimulate in the orofacial motor cortex, you do actually get responses, which is really awesome, even though this is not where we necessarily anatomically traced some of our neurons. But when we do go to the LMC where we did trace neurons, the response is actually slower. And so sort of the where I consider the late, the onset of the MG to be happening is marked in the red diamond, which is just two standard deviations above the mean for this uh, trace. I'll just sort of clarify that these are rectified traces. Um, so that's why they're all sort of absolute values. So this was just kind of an interesting thing. The LMC is where we found potentially direct um, motor neurons, not the anterior regions, what might be going on here. But I also recorded from the digastric muscle, same pattern again, the anterior motor cortex showing earlier responses than the more posterior regions of motor cortex. And just to kind of give you a broad sense of what many of these traces look like in population, it's pretty clear that the more posterior laryngeal motor cortex has a much slower response than the anterior um, orofacial motor cortex. And if we quantify the population of these latencies, very clear again, that there is quite a difference between the two regions. I'll note that the LMC does have quite some variety. There are some earlier and some later responses. We'll just need to investigate that further. Um, and some of it does happen to be a little bit of noise, especially the cricothyroid muscle. There's sort of breathing rhythms that'll uh, sort of get recorded and those are hard to parse uh, out of the signal. So just kind of an overall rep, uh, sort of summary is that the orofacial motor cortex has earlier responses than does the laryngeal motor cortex in two different muscles, both used in orofacial um, behaviors. So again, to kind of recap our hypothesis was that we would have direct projections based on our anatomy and we could measure this at short latencies. This was sort of our expected model, but based on our results, perhaps there is another set of direct projecting motor neurons that we did not capture for technical reasons in our transsynaptic tracing. Another possible model that I would like to sort of investigate and think there might be something to it is that there's a difference in the inhibitory control of these two regions where the laryngeal motor cortex has sort of the central and sort of canonical M1 has a lot of in inhibition that we're having to surpass compared to the OFC. Therefore, you have sort of a slower latency as the circuits try to build up enough activity to discharge. Alternatively, both regions, again, for technical reasons, OFC would not have been captured, but also has direct projections. LMC, it's not necessarily a difference of inhibition, but rather the LMC needs to raise the sub sub-threshold voltage of the ambiguous motor neurons for them, the reticular formation to provide firing, whereas the UFC could have more direct uh, control through stronger synapses. These are just kind of proposals that I'm throwing out. Obviously we need to investigate these. And 
for the OFC, I'm just going to throw out that there is this uh, really cool early study from 2005 uh, where they showed that in the anterior motor cortex for whisker control, um, rats and mice later have been shown to also have this. There's a direct projection to the facial nucleus, which is the motor nucleus for uh, whisking. So this would not be the first time that we have an anterior direct projecting uh, circuit. So I'd like to thank people from our lab, particularly a uh, rotation student we had, Elena Wademan, who helped collect some of this data, and Michael and Arco, who are collaborators and have been very helpful in sort of conceptualizing a lot of this study. And for the Americans, please go vote. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Sure. And let's look at if there are questions, please post your questions to the Q&A box. And uh, while we're waiting, I'm going to ask you something. So sure. um, what is the, uh, the, the functional outcome? What, is, what exactly is the, the latency is representing in, in a functional sense? Right, so there, there's, that's actually a really cool question where as I've gotten sort of thrust into this literature it gets more and more confusing. Uh, presumably you could uh, say that the sort of vocalizations in particular have very quick dynamics um, as Arco described even right like exchanges can have happen in less than 500 milliseconds you want very quick control of that. Mouse vocalizations can happen in less or sort of these modulations are within 100 milliseconds. So you need very tight control of the vocal production and vocal output. And again, you're coordinating a lot of muscles at the same time. You don't want things to trip on each other. So that, that would sort of be my guess. But then where I say it's kind of interesting is in human studies, for example, stimulating um, awake patients seems to have a slower latency than anesthetized patients. Hmm. So why that happens, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, maybe there's some sort of cognitive top-down. Obviously, the uh, top-down, it, it's always sort of what we use as an excuse for things not going the way we think, but um, that would be my proposal for that. Nice. There is one question from Dari. Is yes. there any spatial organization of the neurons controlling the uh, larynx? I'm sorry, <laughs> in either OFC or the area you found? Are there cell bodies relatively close together within these areas? Yeah, it's really hard to s tell right now, uh, mostly because, as I said, for the anterior region, we had not traced these. So we're going to have to come up with other. And obviously, there's like Delta G and some other cool tracing techniques that we can use. We use pseudorabies virus, uh, just to kind of clarify that technical point. Um, yeah, we have not been able, we have not yet, not that we haven't been able to, we haven't yet done any of the spatial mapping to see sort of where along the ambiguous, for example, or where in the cortex. What is interesting though, that um, when I showed some of the anatomy to somebody who works in mouse forelimb, he immediately thought that where we traced the LMC was actually gonna be uh, forelimbs until he read my poster and was like, wait, that's not what I thought it was. So there seems to be sort of a very tight packing within the motor cortex across different muscle systems. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker while she set up her slide.